sometimes it doesn't smell as nice in organic club. Um, we start with nutmeg. We're going to extract out of that trimeristin. So we'll talk about trimeristin here in a little bit. And then we use that trimeristin. Next week we will form meristic acid with that trimeristin. So um, trimeristin, this is its structure. There's a lot of carbon and hydrogen involved. Here's our trimeristin. It's a triester because we have three ester groups of glycerol. Okay, it's um, it is um, a fatty acid that we find in um, in nutmeg, and usually um, most um, most fatty acids are some tri um, triester of glycerol, and usually they're a homo triester. So they're each of these units is the same thing. That's what makes it the homo triester. Okay? Um, so this is this is our fat. Um, it's about 20% um, of nutmeg by mass, and that's kind of a round number, okay? So Here's a, this is actually our fat, and then we'll go on to make our acid next week with it. Um, it's not very soluble in things that are really polar, okay? like methanol, which we'll get to get back to methanol here in a little bit. It is it does not dissolve well in that because even though we've got these ester groups here, it has <coughs> it has all these methyls and methylenes here. So lots of carbon and hydrogen. We've got 12 repeating methylenes before we get to the terminal methyl group on each of these chains. So um, it is not very soluble in things that are polar. It is very soluble in nonpolar solvents. actually a solid, so what you'll isolate this week is a solid, but it has a lower melting point being that it is a fat, okay? Um, so one thing I'm gonna, we we're talking about pre-lab here. Let me get this guy started. Um, I'm gonna kind of start going through some of the parts of this using um, the pre-lab for experiment three. So in your lab manual, is the pre-lab for experiment three. I've made a little few modifications to it, so I've actually posted on Moodle um, like an updated experiment three. So that's what I'm going to use to go over here. So on Moodle, it's just listed as experiment three from the lab manual for week number four. So that is the entire experiment. Where you want to go for the pre-lab is pages eight and nine have the information for the pre-lab on it. Um, and so you can use this as a reference for, for your pre-lab. Where I made the changes is some of the wording in the purpose. Okay? Um, <coughs> And so it will. It has the pieces just like you need for your pre-lab. You've got your title, you've got your purpose, it's got the balance equations. For the first part of the experiment, we're just extracting trimeristin from the nutmeg, so there's not a chemical transformation that happens during that first part, so there's not a reaction to show for part number one, okay? Um, 
when we convert our trimerist into the meristic acid, then there are reactions to show. So those are the reactions you want to show. Our um, reactions and products um, physical data table is more extensive than we had for experiment one. We want to list all the solvents we're using, all the reagents we're using, our starting materials here, um, as well as make sure that you're complete in listing what your products are. So meristic acid, we also do form glycerol um, as a byproduct because of um, breaking down our, our trimeristin. Okay, so here's a physical data table that you can use that information to help fill out your own physical data table. Um, and then the flow charts are broken down into two pieces. So the first one is showing just the extraction of the trimeristin from the nutmeg. There's no reaction that took place beforehand. So this <coughs> is basically the workup step because there isn't anything we did to the trimeristin before we started extracting it. Okay? So um, part one, our flow chart involves the extraction of the trimeristin from the nutmeg. Part two is going to look a little bit different than any flow diagram you've seen so far because usually the chemistry or what we've been doing in lab for the most part was for the most part reflected in the flow chart. In general, when we do a chemical reaction, we'll show our reactions in that first part where you listed, wrote out the reactions. And what happens in the flow diagram is the after part. After the reaction, what happens next to get down to your final product? And that's what you want to show in that flow diagram. So that's why basically we start at the reaction mixture at the end of the reaction making the sodium meristate and then go on from there as far as showing where things go for the flow diagram. Okay? So this is going to be a little bit different than experiment one because of the type of reactions we were doing in experiment one were basically workup reactions. So our reactions and our flow diagram looked a lot alike. Now we are getting into where we're doing more complex things. Our reactions are going to be listed um, in the section previously, and then what happens after the reactions is what we put in our flow diagrams. Okay, so just keep that in mind for experiment three, where we give you this information. But after experiment three, you're going to have to start drawing these, writing out your pre-lab completely on your own. Okay, so um, keep in mind the differences. All right. Um, don't forget, so I, the special equipment is not drawn in here. So what you will need to draw is. You'll need to show fluted filter paper. That's something that you learned how to use this week. So if you haven't drawn it in a pre-lab before, you want to show that. And then you also want to show a drawing for a reflux apparatus. Those are the two pieces of equipment and apparatus that you will use now that you haven't used previously. We're still going to use vacuum filtration. And we're going to use simple distillation like you did in experiment one, but you showed all of that information in experiment one's pre-lab, so you don't have to show it again um, in experiment three. Just reference back to those pages when you discuss it in your experimental. Yeah? What do you mean by fluid and filter paper? Fluted filter paper. I'll show you an example here in a little bit. Um, and there's there's some drawings in your lab. Um, then also <coughs> the reference is old. So make sure that you put the prop, proper reference in there. Don't write that for <coughs> verbatim because that's not really <coughs> correct. Okay? So make sure you put in your proper reference. And then um, this example calculation is based upon, you're given a range for how much trimeristin that you can use for part two. So this is using the maximum amount that you can use for part two. Um, so it's, it's fine to use your sample cal show your sample calculation based on that, but make sure you understand all the pieces of this calculation and how these things were found. Um, <coughs> you will need to show another set of calculations when you're done with the experiment, when you actually have how much trimeristin did you use and carry that through to figure out your theoretical yield of the meristic acid. Okay. All right. So on Moodle for Chem 255-11 is where the updated um, experiment three is, and you can use that pre-lab in, in there to help you for experiment three. All righty. Um, okay, let me get out of here real quick. Did it go away? Is it slowly going away? It's slowly going away. Um, so we
when we are using the trimaricin um, in experiment three, we are showing how you use, um, how you isolate a natural product from plant or animal material.
So um, the people that work on this kind of thing, um, actually, here's, here's one more. Um, so another example of a natural product is something that's extracted a lot is caffeine, right? Because um, to actually get caffeine, you're extracting it either from coffee, tea, other other sources. That's where where the caffeine is coming from. Um, but a natural products chemist. Kind of the steps involved for this person. Is first going to get the um, compounds that they can extract from the plant or animal material. So that's a lot like using a separatory funnel with two, two liquids, but this time one phase is a solid and one, one phase is a liquid. So it's very similar to what you did in experiment one. Um, so here, here's when we get to our fluted filter plate paper. We're going to gravity filter um, the nutmeg with fluted filter paper. So this is a different type of filtration than what you did when you were doing a vacuum filtration. And with gravity filtration, typically when you use that, 
you don't want the solid that you are collecting, okay? So you use gravity filtration when you don't want the solid. When you want the solid, then you will use vacuum filtration. So in this case, we're gonna stir our nutmeg with our ethyl ether, and we're still gonna have parts of the nutmeg left, because trimerosin isn't all of the nutmeg. So we're still gonna have solid parts of nutmeg left. We've gotta filter that away, okay? Um, and so in your lab manual, it shows you kind of a diagram of fluted filter paper. Um, we, won't be, we won't need the rag around the flask because it's not hot. So this was shown in um, reference to doing a hot filtration, but it's the same, same idea. So we're gonna have an Erlenmeyer flask. You'll have your funnel. You don't wanna use your long stem funnel here. So ideally you can use your no stem funnel um, or worst case your powder funnel, but don't use your long stem funnel because if you use the funnel that has a stem on it, as things are filtering through, your trimerist will start crashing out in the stem of your funnel, okay? So that's why you don't wanna do that. But the filter paper, how it has all these pleats in it, that's what we're gonna show you in lab this week is how to put the pleats in the filter paper, okay? And so when you are doing this, um, in a minute here, I'm gonna talk about the ether, but what you wanna do is carefully pour what you're going to filter and then cover everything with saran wrap so that your ether doesn't um, disappear on you. It will evaporate really quickly. Also, even before you filter, you're going to stir the nutmeg in the ether for a little while. Make sure you have plastic wrap on the flask while that's happening. And you wanna stir it really well, so make sure you clamp your flask so it doesn't walk away, okay? So the plastic wrap helps the ether not disappear, um, but you also want to clamp, clamp your flask so it doesn't, doesn't walk off the hot plate on you, okay? So this is what we're talking about with the fluted um, filter paper. Um, now we, we're using ether, and so there's multiple names for diethyl ether, okay? The diethyl ether, there's ethyl ether, Also, in general, usually if we just say ether, we, as talking about solvent, we're meaning of diethyl ether, or this is kind of shorthand to write it as well. Okay, so all these things mean mean the same thing. Um, things to keep in mind with this is it's really volatile, so it disappears really quickly. The boiling point is about 34 degrees Celsius, so it. it um, disappears very quickly, especially in a hood with a lot of airflow. Um, it's also really flammable. So we don't want to use it near a heat source, directly on a heat source. So when you are stirring your nutmeg in your ether this week, make sure you're not also heating your nutmeg in ether solution, okay? We'll, dis we'll get the ether to disappear really quickly, but also that could be potentially dangerous because we'll have lots of ether fumes right around on the hot plate, okay? Um, eventually, I'm gonna talk to you about um, distilling this when we use a water bath, and part of that is because we don't want it to get so hot right directly around, around the ether, okay? So just be careful with ether. It is really flammable. You have to keep in mind um, its flammability and be careful with that when you're, you're handling it so we don't get it to spontaneously ignite. Um, now with the extraction, you want to extract your um, nutmeg two to three times, okay? And what you are looking for when you filter it is in, so like nutmeg's kind of red, reddish, orangish, brownish color. In the filter paper, you should see that color. If you see that color, but it kind of looks lighter than it should be, or you see off-white color in there as well, that's the trimeristin. The trimeristin is an off-white solid, like a white to off-white solid, okay? So if you end up with a lot of white to off-white solid in here, we may need to do another extraction. After your second extraction, if it's mainly, um, red brown solid that doesn't look like there's any trimeristin left in it, then, then you're probably okay, all right? And so follow the instructions in your lab manual. If you have any questions, make sure you 
um, ask your lab prof. You do want to do a good job with the extraction because we need a certain amount of nutmeg next week um, to do next week's experiment, okay? So we need um, probably at least greater than a gram and probably more towards on our way to about one and a half grams wet this week. So like this week, if you were to weigh it, it's still going to have a lot of solvent on it, okay? Um, <clears throat> but we want to make sure that we have plenty of trimaristin for next week. So next week's um, experiment, we're going to have the trimaristin dry over the week. It'll be, we need between 0.7 and 1 gram of trimaristin to do the experiment next week, okay? So you want to do a really good job with the extraction make sure you get all your trimaristin out that you need. Um, now the extraction itself depends on a couple of things. Like this is this extraction and in general. First of all, what's important is the solubility of what you are trying to extract needs to be soluble in the solvent, okay? So the solid, I'm, in, I'm sort of solid, I'm just going to say compound in general needs to be soluble in the solvent, your desired compound. will go, the more, com more um, the desired compound will get out. <coughs> so that's why, at a minimum, we're going to do this two times, and in some cases we'll need to do it three times to get, get all that trimaristin out. So um, that's why, like, we have you do two times 30 mils at least. That's going to be better than we just put it all together and did it once with 60 mils of ether. Okay. Other th thing that's important is contact. And so that's why we're using powdered nutmeg. So we're not just taking like, like nutmeg is actually a nut. We're not just taking the solid nut and throwing it in your flask. We're, we're using powdered nutmeg because you can get better contact of the solvent on all the bits. Same with uh, when you did the um, extraction in the first experiment, you shook your separatory funnel because that gives you better contact of the two <coughs> layers with each other, okay? So that contact is really important. Um, I've talked about, um, you wanna make sure that you have really good stirring um, and make sure you clamp your flask when you are done, you're going to combine all your ether extracts. That was good to see, sir. Caught it. Um, you want to make sure you combine all your ether extracts and look at them if there is like grains of nutmeg still in them, you may <laughs> want to do one more gravity filtration to get the nut nutmeg remnants out of there, okay? Just be careful if you have what also looks like solid forming from the trimaristin. You add enough ether to it that when you filter it, you don't have your trimaristin crashing out um, with your nutmeg, okay? Um, but we're going to uh, combine our ether extract, and then what we're going to use is what's called a concentration. So we're going to we're going to use simple distillation, okay? But we're not going to distill like we did with our hexane in experiment one. We're not distilling it all till we can get rid of absolutely all of the hexane. We're um, just going to distill it down to where you have about 15 milliliters of ether left. And the reason for that is we need to get rid of 
our ether because the trimersin is really soluble in it, okay? But the other thing about the ether is it's not that we are just dissolving trimericin in the ether. We're dissolving trimericin and other things from the um, nutmeg, okay? So there's other impurities that are in there. We want those impurities to stay soluble in a little bit of ether, but we don't want our trimericin all um, stuck in there as well. So we're going to distill most of it away, but not all of it. So we're going to leave about 15 milliliters, okay? Um, then you're going to add methanol to this distillation pot. So you're going to cool everything down to room temperature, and then you're going to add methanol, and that should help precipitate the trimericin. Um, a lot of times when you add the methanol, right away it'll start precipitating out, but sometimes it takes a little bit. So don't start filtering if you don't have a decent amount of solid, or if you don't have any solid, don't start filtering, okay? Um, also, if you have any questions about the concentration step, make sure you do take off down to 15 mils. You don't want to leave much more than 15 mils, and if you're not quite sure, it's always okay to go a little under. Worst case, we'd add a little bit more ether to it versus not taking it down far enough, you get to this methanol step and you don't have any trimercin crash out because there was too much ether left in there, okay? But you should, after you add the methanol, get um, some precipitate to form. If it doesn't form right away, what I would do is um, get your pan and fill it with some cold water and maybe put just a little bit of ice in it, not like a full-on ice bath, but cold water with a few chunks of ice in it, okay? and stir it for a couple minutes in that, that will probably help that solid start precipitating out, okay? And you wanna make sure you've got all of your solid precipitated out before you start filtering, all right? Um, then you're going to filter with vacuum filtration this time because you want the solid. <coughs> okay. um, and after you filter it with um, vacuum filtration, you're going to rinse the solid with a mixture that's three to one. So you're going to have to make this. It's three to one, methanol to ether. Okay. And you want this to be cold. <coughs> so get that cold in an ice bath. Um, while you're doing this filtration, okay? You don't want to do, use warm of that mixture because you may dissolve your trimercin as you pour it over it in the vacuum, in your, um, into your funnel, in the vacuum filtration, okay? Then once you're done with the vacuum filtration, <coughs> you want to put your trimercin somewhere that it's going to be safe, um, and then you'll let it stay, like don't close it off, so don't put it like in a vial. We want it to dry out over the week, so. A good place to put it would be like a small beaker. So last week, you potentially had your unknowns from experiment one in a beaker. Over the pro if you haven't transferred them to vials during the process of the week this week, get those transferred to vials, clean out one of your small beakers, and then you can put your trimeristin in there. And what I would do is you need to know how much trimeristin you have next week. I would know the mass of that clean, dry beaker before you put your trimeristin in there. Then it's really easy to figure out what you've got for next week. And you could also even just check to see if you're in the ballpark for um, the wet mass for, for this week, okay? Um, then when you are done with, um, with both the extraction and then doing the concentration, your filter paper that had the nutmeg in it, okay, you want to have that air dry in your hood for a little while. And then there's a waste container in the reagent hood for that, okay? You could also put your filter paper from, from this stuff in there as well. What you don't want in there is any solvent, okay? Because once we get all the solvent off of the nutmeg, that filter paper and nutmeg we can just put in the garbage because it's no different than just regular nutmeg once we get rid of the solvent, okay? So in the nutmeg waste, all that goes in there is nutmeg and filter paper. Do not put any solvent in there. 
your Erlenmeyer floss from the extraction may have some nutmeg around the sides and so forth. Um, what you can do is scrape out as much as you can into that nutmeg waste. Don't use a solvent to rinse it. Just scrape it out. And then whatever's left in there, it's no different than if you were cooking and you had remnants of nutmeg left in whatever you were cooking with. So then you can um, just clean it like you normally would. All right. But be really careful to keep the nutmeg waste solvent free, water free, any of that, because then we'll have to go through and filter everything again if we get solvent in there. So keep, keep all <laughs> that out of there. Um, from the um, extraction, the other thing you will figure out, besides eventually getting the mass of your trimeristin, you want to calculate your extraction yield. And so there's not going to be um, a percent yield like you will do for um, once you make your meristic acid. This is just going to be an extraction yield. So it's like a percent recovery. So you will take the mass of the nutmeg that you started with at the beginning, and you will take the mass of your dry trimeristin. I'm just going to abbreviate here. Our dry trimeristin divided by the mass of the nutmeg times 100, okay? And that will get our um, percentage for our extraction yield, all right? Now this isn't going to be huge because I told you, you know, there should be about 20% trimeristin in the nutmeg, all right? So it's not going to be a huge number, but you want to figure out what, what that extraction yield was, okay? And one thing you don't want to do is say, okay, mass of dry trimeristin, let me take 20% of the mass of the nutmeg because then that should get me to close to like 100% yield. Don't do that. You want to use just the mass of the nutmeg itself. Don't, don't change it mathematically to be something different, okay? Um, but this is a calculation that you do want to put in your notebook once you have the dry mass of your meristic acids, or of, sorry, of your trimeristic, okay? Um, now next week, we're going to take that trimeristin and convert it to the meristic acid. So, to react this with sodium hydroxide and we need three equivalents because there's three of these chains. I'm going to knock that overhead. And um, We'll do this, we'll talk about what it means to use reflux. We're going to um, do this with ethanol as our solvent and then reflux. And in the end, what we will get is our, um, we'll get our sodium meristate, so we don't get the acid right away. We get the salt, basically. So like our benzoic acid salts this time, it's going to be the salt of our um, meristic acid. So this is the sodium meristate. And then we also lose then that glycerol piece.
we'll take our sodium myristate. Once you've 